Hello, everyone. My name is Eduardo, and I'm back with the Karimu Talks. And today it's a very, very special Karimu Talks because we not only have our co founders, Don and Marianne, but you also have a very special guest uh, that is Julian Page. Julian is the founder of Livingstone Tanzania Trust. And I will start asking Julian uh, to introduce himself and, of course, saying you are very welcome here, Julian. Welcome, Julian. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Julian Page, and I founded the Livingston Tanzania Trust in 2007 um, after a career change. I used to work in the facilities management in law firms. And um, I don't know if you have it over there. We have Comic Relief or Red Nose Day. It's a kind of um, every two years they have a big event and it, there, there are video clips of the tragic situations around the world. And one of them really just resonated with me. It was about two street kids living in Dar es Salaam, um, a three-year-old girl and a one-year-old girl, uh, sisters. And the one-year-old couldn't walk because rats had eaten her feet. And they were living on the street and it was it was just too awful and my brother had kids the same kind of age and it, it suddenly became very personal and i thought you know what i want to do something different i want to go and sort something something like that out so i went and did a master's in international development um and then set up the livingston towns near trust to try and solve problems ended up not doing any work with street children but i had the impetus so that's where wow, I'm coming very from. Inspiring. Very inspiring. Very inspiring. Thanks for your time and generosity in sharing your stories here, Julian. I think it will be a great conversation. We also have Don and Marianne, the co-founders of Karimo Foundation. So Don and Marianne, you want to introduce yourself here? Uh, well, I'll go first because I think Marianne's going to tell the story of the founding of Karimu. I'll just say briefly that, uh, yes, my name is Don. Stall and, and I worked in in education for my career, uh, some uh, higher education, but also secondary. I am now retired since uh, gosh uh, uh, about fifteen days ago. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I mean I, I do a little a little tiny bit of tutoring of of young children, but mainly I'm just working for Karimu, and it, and it, it feels. Feels good to be retired from um, from my paying job, and 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 good to be to be working for nothing for Karimu. I'm very happy to be doing it. Okay, yeah, we are very happy to have you full time in Karimu. It's very important to have you focus here. And Marianne, you, uh, how are you? And welcome. I'm to doing this really well, and I'm I'm just. Uh, I was so touched. I had heard this story about Julian and how he got involved with doing development work in Tanzania before, but when hearing him tell it again, I was really moved because so many people will see a sad picture or a video or come across a sad situation and they'll feel bad and they'll want to do something about it, but they don't follow through because life takes them in a different direction. And I, I've admired that from the moment I met Julian, the way he just um, moved by, you know, he put his his feelings and his empathy into words. And um, so and we action. started, no. it, yeah, into action, not into words. <laughs> yeah, and, and so in 2007, uh, we had the uh, pleasure of meeting Julian in Babati, which is near the communities that Karimu serves. And he was staying at the time in a guest house and he was working um, for no salary and just giving all of his time to renovating this school, the Wangarai school. And we were so impressed with his work and Don and I were like babies. We were on this cultural safari tour and we had no idea where we were going to be taken. We, we knew we were gonna be taken on a bus to some rural area. So when I met Julian in Babati, I was like, let's just stay here with julian i don't want to go any farther this is great we'll just help him <laughs> and then we were told nope you have to go farther so we were taken out into the bush into the rural area there was only dirt roads at the time to the rural area of um isla Gaia ward and i don't want to take up too much time because i want to get julian involved in the conversation but 
we were taken to a, a family. We stayed there for about a week. Uh, they had 11 children, no running water, no electricity. They knew we were uh, school teachers, that we were involved in education. So they took us to their school that the government was going to close. And there was not a proper toilet for 250 students, uh, just a shallow hole in the ground with like a bamboo hut with gunny sacks or something over it for privacy. And the villagers had tried to come together and finish some latrines, but they didn't have the $500 that was needed to finish the latrine. So we were, of course, weeping um, uh, over this situation. Um, kind of like the same thing with Julian, seeing that, that you, how do you walk away from that, seeing that, that level of poverty? Um, I don't know how you just say no and walk away. So we said, you know, we could donate $500 to finish the latrines. And we thought we had done our good deed. And then we were going to leave and go home and do fundraising at the school. But the head of school just gazed into Don's eyes and said, and, no, you're part of our family now. You must come back. So then and there, we decided we were going to start a nonprofit. And then we came back through Babati and told Julian about it. And I think just within that short period of a week, um, when oh, I was just... like a baby, like saying, no, I don't want to leave Julian to like, now I'm in the bush and now I'm talking about starting a nonprofit. It was an amazing transformation. Okay. Uh, Julian. What is your version of this story? So you guys <laughs> met in this trip in 2007. To me, it's very difficult to moderate this, this conversation because I get emotional when listening to these stories. But Juliet, what is your side of this story? Tell us. Well, I was, I, as I say, as Marianne says, I was working in Wangarai trying to do some uh, renovation work of that school. And I've been there, I should think, a couple of weeks on my own. And then these two Americans walked in through the door um, and were full of life and adventure and nervousness. And we just started talking. And uh, I don't, we haven't stopped talking since, I think. I mean, and, and off they went, you know. And I was so excited for them because, you know, they would actually, they're on a trip of a lifetime. It was one of their dreams. I remember Marianne saying, we've always dreamed of coming to Africa. And, and boy, were they coming to Africa. They were doing things that most tourists wouldn't dream of doing. Um, and that I just loved because that's what it's all about. It's about getting off the beaten track and visiting and, and interacting with real people, not just the people you know in the tourist industry. Um, so yeah, I was delighted to have some, some brilliant, entertaining company. <laughs> and, okay, and uh, Marianne, how did uh, Julian really influence you i i am sure that you uh, there was a spark when you heard uh, uh, his stories but exactly specifically how did he influence you and don well i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about kind of in broad strokes how i was inspired about him and then don can give you some more specifics and we were just visiting julian in london this year and we were like yes. making this uh list of all the things uh, he hosted us at his home and we were making a list of all the things that he's done for Karimu and by contacting um, his contacts and his influences. So I'm going to let Don speak to that. But I will say um, it was just he gave us the confidence. I figured if he could do it, we could do it. I don't mean that like, well, if he can do it, <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> but I, I just thought, well, here is this one person who's making a difference and and he he went before us he was the path blazer really the trailblazer you know that um he he i thought well there he is giving his heart and soul to this and you know he just inspired me to to move and to act so I, I, I think, Don? yeah i i think in part because uh, of course we were in a place that seemed very alien to us at, at that time 2007 and I think we were tempted to ask uh, 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 our 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 tour host whether we could remain with Julian because it felt very comfortable. You know, I'm Jul Julian's from from the UK. We're from the United States, but but compared to Africa, those uh, those two worlds, the UK and the US, are identical, right? 
So it felt very, very comfortable. Uh, and, and the fact that we were with someone who felt pretty much exactly like us it, it, in those circumstances, um, I think that gave us confidence. Look, here's someone from, from our world, effectively, who, who is in this very alien place, and he's decided to do this kind of work. Well, we can do that too, right? I mean, if, if, this, guy from, if this guy from London can do it, uh, I mean, we're from the Wild West by comparison, right? Okay. I mean, we, you know, we can, we can pack our six guns and do it too, right? Um, I would say also, uh, um, uh, I, have a, I have a very strong recollection uh, of him talking about, uh, about development work and, and saying that he to it, in his view at, at that time already, was that you have to listen to the people that you're trying to help. You, you must not carry with you your ideas about what they need. You must listen to them. And uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to say that Julian instructed us because other people could have had ideas as well uh, about what we ought to do. But that idea resonated with us. That that felt intuitively right, right to listen to to uh, in this case to the people in Ayalagaya Ward, and, and that's a principle that remains that remains right at the heart of Caring that remains crucial to us. And and since Marianne got just a little bit ahead of the game here by mentioning the contacts that Julian has 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 given us. Uh, he put us in touch with Inspire Worldwide, a, a, a Bristol, UK-based organization that handled our volunteers for, oh geez, I, I, I guess it would have been for more than 10 years. He put us in touch later after, after uh, Inspire Worldwide had been dissolved, I, I think, he put us in touch with Greenlight Ventures, which uh, which is also based in in the south of the UK, and, and now they handle our volunteers. And he also put us in touch with what has become, uh, uh, I suppose, our second biggest donor and very important to us, Social Capital Foundation, which is a a, a Spanish foundation that's been very generous with uh, uh, in funding various projects of ours. So. You know, so Julian's been invaluable to us in 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 that range of ways. I I could go on, but I think I've I think I've spoken enough. So that's fantastic. I, now I know the source of many important foundations of Caribou. So this part yeah. of listening to the community is something that uh, uh, it's extremely strategic and extremely impactful here in Caribou. So Julian, um, so you met in two thousand and seven these guys here they they said that you open doors and they tra your, your example transformed them in what i called uh special jedis to do the goods <laughs> so uh, i'm a big fan of star wars uh, and you are you are also a, a important jedi here uh, uh, actually, you 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 were very important in the beginning and i'm sure that uh, other introductions helped Karimu to develop. But what did you see Marianne and John and all the structure and, 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 and management of Karimu, what did inspire you? So you follow this story for, for more than 15 years. So what did Karimu did that you also learned from Marianne and John? Wow, um, so much. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I, we have such a good relationship because we're always sharing ideas and learning from each other. Um, nobody has the answers, but we're always tweaking and suggesting, and what about this, what about that? Um, so the things that I have taken away from Karimu start with, I think, the mentality that even in the hardest times, there's still time for laughter and happiness. Because I always see that in Don and Mary Ann. They might be struggling with communications on this and that, but it's always fun and, and, and full of love. So I'm always reminded of that whenever I go into the field. What would, what would they do? How would they do it? Um, so I've learned that. I've also looked strategically at what they're doing. And, and they've done things differently than what uh, the Livingston Tanzania Trust has done. They much more 
holistic uh, than we ever were. We wanted to be holistic, but they've taken it to the next level. And they've looked at poverty and gone into lots of different things um, that I'm now thinking, yeah, well, I should be doing some of those things too. Um, and I've done them on small grounds. You know, they have brought water to 40,000. I brought water to 6,000, <laughs> not just six people. That would be very sad. Um, but so there's lots of things that we learn from each other um, in that regard. Um, also, I think when they started doing some of their agricultural projects and they looked at market linkages, it made me think, of course, of course, it's not just about helping farmers to improve their yields, reduce their losses. Um, it's about connecting them to other markets outside of Abati, because that's really where some some wealth can be found for those farmers. And Karimu were, were doing that long before we did it. Um, and it kind of inspired me, of course, that's what we must be doing. So, you know, we take away a lot of things from each other. It's it's fantastic. I appreciate you yeah. saying that, um, Julian. Um, we have to give Nelson Matos, uh, the RCOO, a big applause for, for taking Karimu to the next level and thinking more strategically like that. But I had never heard that, um, that we look like we're having fun. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I'm glad it appears that way, but it is. It's it's a level of it's a level of commitment, really. It, it's like family. You're never going to walk away from a member of your family or a friend, or so. It's really not a job as much as it is um, these all these people, all forty thousand of them. We made a commitment to, and you can't walk away from a commitment. When people often say to us well, you know, there's homeless people in California. Why aren't you helping them? And my answer is always, we made friends there and you don't turn your back on friends. And and friends have to be held accountable as well for each other. It can't be a top, you know, one is superior and the other is dependent, et cetera. And that's something else you taught us too. You gave us that great idea of all the parents, for example, must contribute to school lunches. Um, and otherwise you don't do a project. They, everybody, every kid needs to be fed. Why would you build a classroom or do that unless number one, the kids are fed. So you really gave us that as well. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Cause I got that from somebody else. Uh, I got that from a, a donor who was visiting and who told me, he said, you're building fantastic classrooms, but what's the point? If the kids are hungry and they're coming to school, they're not going to learn another thing. You're wasting your time. And then we had a big discussion with him about, well, if I start feeding all of these kids, then surely I'm just creating dependency and they become dependent on us. So that's not the right thing to be doing either. Um, and that really encouraged us to move on in our model from what we were essentially at the very beginning was a kind of donor organization into a participatory development organization. So we were we we evolved in that kind of sense as a result of that conversation with that donor. Um, so it's one of the things that I'm quite proud of as a charity that we continually evolve uh, as we learn new things, as the environment in which we work keeps changing. You know, we can't stand still, the situation doesn't stand still. So let's keep changing, keep evolving. Very good. So um, uh, we spoke about having fun and the joy of the work we are we are doing here. But I'm sure there were some very, very complicated challenges that uh, we all face during this journey. I, I want to ask about the most complicated phase of your journey when you thought about giving up. So my first question is, did you think about giving up and say, I can't do this anymore. I can't solve this problem. And what was this worst experience during this so many years journey? Marianne, you can start. You're, you're, you, Marianne. you're muted. Oh, well, I guess I can't say anything if I'm muted, right? Uh, I, I think it was... Oh gosh, 
I think one of it was um, we didn't have a lot of communication with the villages in the beginning um, and nobody had cell phones, et, et cetera. And we were only going through one person who was sort of bottlenecking the communication. And that was very, very difficult. Um, I never had thought of giving up though. I have to be honest. I, I, I really never have thought of giving up because I, I remember even saying to Julian once if like, well, if it ends up that all we can do is build a bridge like we've done or bring water to one school, if that's all we can do, I will keep going back. I mean, of course we wanted to do more. Then I think it was also the challenge of how do we move from raising such a small amount of money as Don and I were doing and we were the only fundraisers. And I thought, how can we keep going for like, past 15 years if we have now if it's only dawn and me raising the money raising the money and then thank god that uh nelson came with his contacts with google and then people like you have come and you have given us hope as nelson that other people now are carrying the load and also the communication now has expanded etc and then probably the biggest challenge of all was a couple years ago um, the water project that we had specifically said that the water points, the public water points must be free. Otherwise, people are going to go back to dirty rivers and all of the money that the donors put into these projects is going to fail. And we did have some difficulties um, with solving that um, with um, with not with the community, but with some higher ups. And thankfully um, the higher ups in the um, government in Tanzania solved this issue um, by putting us under RUASA, the Rural Water Agency. And we were, because there were a lot of, let me just back up. I don't wanna like put the blame on anybody or anything like that. There was just a lot of movements and shift within the government and the responsibility. And there was a lot of misunderstanding about whether the public water point should be free or not. Thankfully, we resolved that and we were able to move forward. Had that not been resolved, and if the government had said no, public water points are going to be charged, we wouldn't be able to move forward with our project. So everything kind of hinged on that because there had to be an understanding of the purpose of the project and who we were serving and what our goal was at Karimu. And once we got that established, which was not easy, and Nelson had a lot of headaches and sleepless nights, as well as Don and I did. And I even thought, well, if Nelson walks away, I guess we'll stay and just do something very small. But I didn't want to do that, and I didn't want to do it without Nelson. So I know that's a long-winded answer. Sorry about that. Uh, we're facing a big challenge right now. It's it's not one that that inclines us to think about giving up, but it but it's a huge challenge. We we believe that our model of poverty elimination is, is something that can be replicated uh, in 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 in, in uh, any rural community in in any developing country. Uh, with, with with a small number of exceptions, uh, where for example there's uh, uh, well, well where, where there's war ongoing, for example, I don't think we would want to work in a country like that. But uh, so so right now we're we're trying to figure out how we can how we can grow, how we can bring in more funding in order to uh, to to think about moving to you know. Uh, uh, Developing countries, let's say in in Latin America or or uh, uh, or Southeast Asia. That's, but that's an exciting challenge, and it's not something that that is making us think, oh gosh, we're going to have to quit. That that n nothing like that. That's good. And Julian, what was your biggest challenge in this journey? Well, I think looking back. One of the things that I do now, whenever we start a project, is I ask as many people in the in the circle, what does success look like and how do you measure it? And I didn't do that at the beginning. And some of the people in our team didn't necessarily share the same vision of what success looked like. And that then led to uh, conflict down the line. 
because we weren't clear with each other. And then some personal issues came in um, that made it difficult. And so it's the politics of running a small organization, I think, that have been the challenges rather than doing the work itself. Apart from the constant fundraising challenge, the, the, the need is always greater than the money you've got to do it in. Um, but yeah, those were my greatest challenges, I think. But there was never a case of giving up. It's always a case of how do we work around this? How do we work with it? How do we evolve? And, and what was the, the, the most important achievement, the, the best success story that you had that you were very proud of? Well, I've got two. Um, one of them is taking a school from a 28% pass rate to, I think it's 94% pass rate um, in five years. That's, that to me is kind of like, wow. Um, and the other one is building a school from scratch. Um, that is the best school in Babati. And I'm allowed to say that because Donna Mary Ann schools aren't in Babati. <laughs> so there's no competition, but it's a beautiful school. And if I die tomorrow, I will feel like, yeah, that's what I've achieved. And that's what I'd be most proud of. That's fantastic. I'm bringing my family in June to 2025 to, to Babati, and I, I want to, to visit your school. I, I'm, I'm curious to visit this school. And, and, and John and Marianne, what, what makes you proud? of what you guys did in this whole journey? What is the main success story that you remember and you are very proud of? Well, I would, but Marianne might have a different opinion, but but I would say what, what I think Julian has already alluded to, our two water projects for uh, Isla Gaia Ward and also for, for Ari Ward that have brought clean water uh, or made clean water accessible to all 40,000 people in those two wards. I, I think that's our our biggest, uh, uh, it's not a single achievement, but our, our two biggest achievements, I think. Marianne? Well, I think the water has a huge impact, you know, definitely. Um, it just impacts everything, school performance, health, the ability to make income, everything. I, I'm gonna say something on more of an emotional level. I think our biggest achievement has um, to earn the trust of the Ayala Gaia and Ari Ward, because without trust, you can do nothing. And um, I think it is a great honor to be part of those communities. And I always tell the new volunteers, we are guests. We were invited here. We did not decide to go there and do development. We were invited to come in. And so we was, must always remember that it is an invitation and we must like behave ourselves like guests who have been invited. But that trust is irreplaceable. And also to get people like you, Adu, um, who believe in Karimu as much as you do, and you have been drawn into that community as well, to, to see others transformed by that community as as we were and i know you understand what moved us because now you're part of the kari moon circle like that that trust is so important isn't it I, I i kind of forgotten that but it's also part, part of building that trust is being frank and honest and having the strength to say no when no is the answer tanzanian culture is very much yes is the answer but but in development, if you say yes, people expect it. And so actually saying no to the community or to people in power is so important. And that, yeah, builds you your reputation and then your and your integrity. And that means everything in the in the world we're living in. Yeah, I really like that we often have that. to say no, and it is difficult, but but Julian's exactly right. It 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 pays dividends when 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 you can say no up, up if it's necessary. Yeah, that's that. That's great that you said that, Julian. Because how how I said trust is so important, but then how do you build that trust, right? And and it isn't always saying yes. That's for sure. And we try to, and I think we have done, is make good on all of our promises because we're realistic. 
about what we can accomplish and what we can't. And, and we'll say we don't have the money for that, or that's not part of the strategic plan. So, you know, that you, so in the beginning, people would ask us all kinds of things and, you know, like different people pulling at our shirt tails for different requests. But now when the community comes together with all the different constituencies and does this community strategic plan, we can point to it's not on the strategic plan. We, we're not, it's not there. Yeah. I, I need to add something else to this because it's really, I think it's really important that, you know, we recognize that we have this power and we recognize that there is a huge power imbalance between us and the communities that we work with. And we are constantly aware of that and we are constantly trying to give decision making to, to people so that they can have some power so that we are reduced in power but ultimately we know you know we've got the power of the budget but the decision making has to come from the community they have to have the power to say this is what we want this is what we don't want this is how we want to do it this is not how we want to do it and so recognizing power imbalances and and, and allowing people to have power is vital sorry I had this is so important everything you were saying for you that is watching and you are learning about the nonprofit world what these people were saying it's so fundamental for the success of your project in long term um, i was reminding that i i watched it last week the new bill gates show on netflix and in many of the episodes they they talk about the trust that needs to be built on 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 the project with the community so it's not only these people but also uh, bigger foundations larger foundations are, are going on this direction and this is one of the main mistakes that ngos do when they try to to work in africa so uh i think we are all aligned and this message is extremely powerful let's move on and uh, about the future let's talk about the future so are you optimistic are you pessimistic about the future so what are the next steps for both of your organizations so julian you want to to start this one well that's really interesting we are at a, a small crossroads at the moment and we have just started for the last um, two months researching four more communities on the outskirts of Babati. Um, we chose these communities because they house four out of the five worst performing schools in Babati. And we wanted to know why. Why are they all in one place? So we've been out in the community interviewing the elders, separating them by men and women, the middle-aged people, the youth, the teachers, the farmers, the business people, even the students, talking to everybody, trying to find their perspective. And what is it? The, what are the barriers that are preventing young people accessing a quality education? And so we're gathering that feedback at the moment in these four communities, and we will have a, a really good understanding of the challenges they face. And what's quite exciting for us is that we don't know what we're going to be doing next, because they'll be telling us what they want us to do next. Um, and we can't build, you know, we can't build roads. So we can't do some of it, but at least they are telling us and we can share that knowledge with powers that be. But if they're saying we want our primary school to be better or we need a clinic because our kids are too sick or we need a bridge because during the rainy season, we can't get to school. These are things that maybe we can do, um, but they'll be telling us and then we're going to be working on co-production so that we're all sitting around the table at the same time making decisions on how it's going to be who's going to be doing the monitoring everyone's going to say what success looks like from their perspective how it's going to be measured and take responsibility so hopefully our responsibility will reduce as theirs increases and so that's going to be a really exciting new chapter for us so yeah we're thrilled by that and a little bit petrified, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, and amazing. Again, the methodology of listening and and prioritizing according to their point of view—it's it's beautiful. This is so great to that that I learned this. 
Uh, and yeah, I think this is the way to go. Marianne and Don, what's next? What 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 are the plans for the future? Uh, um, I, I think I've already alluded to uh, our, our plan to expand such that we can work not only in other parts of, of Tanzania, but, but uh, outside of Tanzania, indeed outside of Africa. Um, we anticipate that this is going to take take a while, take, take uh, 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 probably a couple of years at minimum. Uh, I believe that in about 15 minutes, Mary Ann's going to be taking a big step towards that. I think she's having a, a meeting to talk about uh, succession. Isn't that right? In about 15 minutes, Mary Ann, you're going to be meeting with someone to, uh, uh, in order to... Yeah, yeah. the other part of our, um, our next steps is uh, how do we pass this on, you know, when... Uh, it is nice that the Tanzanians always say they wish us a long life, but I, I know that <laughs> I know that everybody has their time and you know someday I can't even imagine that, but the day will come where I have to step aside. Maybe I'll be 95 or something and, and then whatever. But um yeah, what what, what do I do that can be passed on and should be passed on? And it's a little difficult. I've been trying to think about this because I think when you're the founder, there's a there's a kind of a special slot you have as a founder. You're kind of like the mother or father. So how do you replace the mother or the father? But how do I help Karimu go to the next step? How do we recruit a, a board that can um, take on the fundraising so it's not just a handful of people? Um, what happens um, for the longevity? of Karimu and how will other NGOs then be attracted to this model and then want to replicate it. Um, one of the things that we've done as we've written the constitution for the board is we actually believe that there must be people on the board at all times to be sort of the, the guardians of the values and the legacy of Karimu. One thing I can say that has never changed about Karimu is uh, the values um, that we don't give to individuals, we only give to the community, we listen, et cetera, um, that you know the, communi the community must partic participate in the projects, it must be a holistic approach to poverty. So even though we've expanded, our values have never changed. And as we grow and as we move on, and as Dawn and I move into uh, old age, how will that be maintained? How will those values be preserved, right? That's great, fantastic. Many, many lessons for, for the younger generation that wants to start their work in nonprofits. So uh, we are almost finishing here. I would ask you to send a message to people that are watching us and also to people that are working on other NGOs, uh, any advice, any any call, so any final words? Julian, you can start. I want, if I may, just to have a quick recap on something that I just think is important that we talk about, and that is understanding what poverty is. Because if we're all sitting here trying to work out how we can alleviate or eliminate poverty, it's really important um, that we understand what poverty is. And I think it's really important for new NGOs to also recognize what poverty is. Um, and I was giving a talk this week to some students in, 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 uh, in England, and I asked that question and it met with deathly silence because they just didn't really know what it was. Um, and so I kind of explained, and it's for us, it's a lack of um, basic needs. You know, we recognize that water, shelter, clothing, blah, 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 blah. But it's also a lack of access to institutions like hospitals, schools, banks, etc. It's also about having low levels of resilience and the ability to bounce back after things go wrong. And it's a lack of voice. It's a lack of access to power. So one of the things that, that both of our organizations, I think, are really good at is giving people power, attacking all of the things that um, they don't have access to. 
So building schools, giving them, making sure that there's water, um, giving them access to credit so they can do things for themselves. Um, and that in that way, they build up their own levels of resilience. So when things go wrong, they can look after themselves. And I think that's really important that people think about that when they're an NGO is how are they going to tackle these things? And then my last piece of advice to them is, what is your exit strategy? Start from the end and work your way back. So again, what does success look like? How do you measure it? How do you get there? What are the things that you have to do? Don't just see a problem and dive in. Think about it strategically. Because it's a lot harder. It's a lot, I mean, it's a lot harder to do it that way. It's much more fun to dive in. Of course it is. But if you want to do it properly, think about how you're going to exit. Sorry. No, that'd <laughs> be exciting. Right. I'm getting a bit excited. That's amazing. Oh, that was good. Nothing to be sorry about. Thank you. <laughs> and it's it, it is very interesting. Um how we are aligned here. So when we, we see the principles of what Karimu does follows very much what you were saying, Julian. Um, we we always need to make the projects self-sustainable in long term. We want to make the community not to depend on us. Uh, we want them to develop themselves. Yeah. Right? We just make some some help in, in, in finding some resources. And uh, it's very interesting to me that I'm new in this world. I'm, I'm working uh, uh, for Karimo for one year. That how strategic and important this is in long term. And I, I being honest, when, when before working for Karimo, I would answer your question that okay, poverty is the lack of money, and it's not lack of money, right? Money is just a resource to 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 help to solve the problems, but the poverty is you don't have water uh, uh, to to uh, to to leave. You don't have access to education, and this will have a tremendous impact in, in long term in your life. Or you don't have a toilet that uh, makes possible for you, to, the students, to go to the to the school, um, and 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 helping them by themselves to prioritize and solve these basic needs this will create uh, uh, this development by themselves, not yeah. because you had that tremendous idea and you have money. No, this is not because you have money and you, you have experience from the West or from macro countries. So very aligned with everything I, I learned. Marianne and John, so what is the message for the new generations and, and the other NGOs? Uh, well, well I, I would thing. say, uh, uh, I'd say, don't <clears throat> beg your pardon. Uh, don't expect to succeed quickly. Uh, e expect that uh, in order to to uh, to achieve your goal, it might not be poverty elimination. I, I you know I, I I expect that that uh, or, or I know that other nonprofits will have will have different missions, but um, uh, e e expect that the work of, of achieving what you want to achieve might take a long time but uh remind yourself that uh the that the rewards not only of 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 achieving the goal but of of working toward the goal of of trying to figure out how to get to the goal the, the rewards are are the rewards are tremendous it, it it's it's worthwhile work, not only to the people that you're that you're that you're attempting to serve. It, it's it's worthwhile to yourself, um, Marianne. Yeah, I just love this talk so much. It's so inspiring. Thank you, everyone. I I think um, what I would want to close with is I think the idea of being able to eliminate poverty just seems so overwhelming. And if you can do it um, in a small way, those small actions will will grow for sure. And I think that one of the most gratifying things is that it's not just putting a Band-Aid on it, it's just not throwing money at it, but you really can see the transformation of lives if you're willing to put the work in. And I think we always talk about changing other people's lives. This has to do with something that Julian was saying about the power shift, right? 
But I think before you change other people's lives, you have to be willing to change yourself. You have to be willing to learn. You have to be willing to be wrong. You have to be willing to be humble. You have to be changed. Because if you go into this work and you're not changed, I, I can't imagine how effective you could be. Beautiful. So, uh, guys, it was amazing. A lot of very profound lessons from you. I want to thank you three for your generosity and for the inspiration you are, not only to me, but I think to everyone that is listening to this, this session. And please keep working hard, keep inspiring us. It's very important to have people that make positive impact in the world. The world needs these good stories. I'm a believer that the good is possible to do the good is possible to change lives is possible to impact it's possible and it's an honor to me to to meet you guys here and to share all these great stories thank you very much for your generosity thank you thank, thank you, you, for you. Us. thank you for those kind and words yeah thank yeah. you right? Good to see you. great to see you julian and one last last message, uh, uh, you can follow us on, on YouTube, uh, Karimo Foundation on YouTube, Karimo Foundation on Instagram and uh, on Facebook. You will also can find all our projects, our trips to Tanzania, volunteer trips in our website. And I'm writing here in the description of this episode, all the information to contact the living stone tanzania trust so if you want to reach out to julian and if you're interested in what he's doing in babati also we are putting here in the description of this episode all contact of julian okay so bye everyone thanks for watching and bye. thank you thank you Adum. thanks bye -bye.